Our first speaker is Dr. Kevin Clark. Uh, Dr. Clark is coming from the Menlo Park area where he teaches at St. Patrick's Seminary. And the topic of his first lecture will be Word, Flesh, and Glory, the Gospel of the Incarnation. Uh, Dr. Clark is a professor of seminarians and is doing a great job and is enthusiastic about his biblical studies and patristic studies. It's a huge blessing to have a scholar who is formed in the art of sacred study of scripture and the fathers of the church. And he also teaches some church history. He was able to finish his doctorate at Ave Maria University under the direction of Dr. Voldstein, one of the great academics in the church in the whole world. And so we're very excited to have uh, Dr. Clark with us to deliver his first address, that being entitled, Word, Flesh, and Glory, the Gospel of the Incarnation. Thank you, Father Theodore, for those uh, very kind words. And I also want to uh, pass along my gratitude to uh, Dr. Bissonette Petrie for the kind invitation. Uh, I, I was uh, very much looking forward to last year and then COVID hit. And so, uh, so I had to wait a whole year uh, to come and be a part of this conference. But uh, I'm sure it's going to be much worth the wait. So uh, very warm greetings to you all uh, and uh, uh, to um, I also want to extend a, a, a warm thank you to uh, Bishop Daly for sending us his uh, wonderful seminarians, your seminarians at, uh, at Spokane. Um, the, the, the men of the di- from the Diocese of Spokane are, are uh, truly remarkable. Um, so I can only conclude that your spiritual support for uh, the men here um, and from your families is a great gift to the church. Uh, for, for my part, my primary area of special, specialization is in, in Maximus the Confessor. I've been translating his uh, Opuscula, which are not yet available in English, and they're frustratingly dense and challenging to unpack, and he's uh, engaging in both theology and polemics. Uh, at the same time, polemics is... is uh, Uh, kind of like waging a spiritual uh, battle against the heretics. And so, uh, but at the the beginning of of many of his works, he he often gives a a kind of a self-deprecating apology for all of his weaknesses. And so I I almost feel like I have to get into character and and apologize for my my own weaknesses as I I prepare you for for this paper. Um, So... uh, you know, adjusting to life in California has been very uh, challenging for us six Clarks. I'm married, and my wife and I have four children, three girls and a boy. Uh, the boy is 20, month, 20 months old, and our eldest is 13. And uh, we, we used to live down in uh, Southern California before my doctoral studies, but um, the past two years here have been extraordinary. Um, <laughs> Uh, since January, I've, I've been a victim of t- two crimes on the highway. Not, not one is enough, but but two. Uh, so January, I was driving home from from the seminary, and I was going over the uh, the, the Bay Bridge, and I, I, you know, I'm just doing what anybody would do. I was listening to um, Augustine's narration on the Psalms being read aloud <laughs> on my laptop. Of what you know, it wasn't it was hands free. The next thing I know, I hear pop, 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 and I throw my jacket up over my head, I'm being shot at. And it's amazing how fast the brain works. One of my first thoughts was, why is it not getting cold in the car? Uh, because, you know, bullets would be letting air in. And then I realized that there, there's like a mustard-colored substance on my window. I, I was shot by a paintballer. And uh, six times when I got home. Uh, and then uh, uh, on... On uh, in mid April, I was uh, hit. I was passed by one of my uh, colleagues on the staff. Calls them SVDs, Silicon Valley drivers. Uh, he whipped into the lane to pass me. He was going probably 20 miles an hour faster than I was, and lost control and sideswiped me. And my head hit the window. And so I'm. I'm. De- I've been dealing with post concussion symptoms for the past uh, couple of months. But you know, from the from the paintball incident, I. I realized I didn't immediately start praying my, my um, act of contrition. I could have been on the verge of death. So 
first thing I do when I get hit, uh, even though I'm, I'm thinking I'm about to lose consciousness and die, uh, is that I start to pray my act of contrition. Then by the time I figured out that I was safe, the guy was gone. Um, so, uh, so anyhow, the, the, what, what, I've, what I've learned from, and this is in addition to all the other uh, challenges of, of living in California, but um, you know, what my experiences over the past year have taught me is that teaching in a seminary is, is something that one does not take lightly. Uh, this is all to say, pray for your seminarians. Yes, of course, fine young men. Like, uh, like Matthew Knight over here, who's had me as, uh, as a professor. But please also pray for your professors, too, <laughs> for their professors. Okay, without further ado. Uh, word, flesh, glory, the gospel of the incarnation. The focus of this lecture will be specifically on John 1.14, which Father Theodore uh, uh, just read. And who is this Logos? who became flesh. And, and, and what is John meaning to say when he says that we have, we have uh, seen his glory? Along the way, I hope to draw strong connections with Christ as the image of the unseen Father uh, and the Eucharistic significance in the word made flesh, whose flesh becomes bread. We'll, uh, we will also have a look at the uh, development of the patristic doctrine. How did the fathers of the church unpack this over the centuries? So I think a brief introduction to the Gospel of John is in order here. It was written by John the Apostle, and clearly he is the same person as the beloved disciple that is referred to in the Gospel, if, if you have uh, hopefully read it. It is the last of the Gospels to be written. In my own opinion, he is the same author as the uh, author of the epistles of, of John. And uh, I think at least that's the best hypothesis out there. I'm also of the opinion that the author of Revelation is also our John. Now, the, the, this is a bit more of a contested opinion, the, but the genres are very different, and you would expect some key differences there. Um, but there are many Johannine connections throughout Revelation as well. But anyway, many who sit down and read through the four Gospels uh, in order have this sort of experience. You know, you, you read Matthew and you really get to know the life and story of Jesus. And then Mark comes along, it's very repetitive. What do you make of that? Then Luke comes along with uh, his own freshness, but then there's also some repetition there. Uh, and then John comes along, the, the fourth gospel, and it's something completely different. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptics. Uh, sin means together, or with an optic is the word for sight, so they see together. Uh, they appear even to copy one another. John comes along later in the mid to late first century to provide his own take. If something particularly important is left out that was included in all three synoptics, John's exclusion of a particular account does not mean that he does not consider it important. He's, he knows what accounts are already out there. So if he skips the words of institution, for example, it does not mean that he does not think that they are important. His Christology soars which is why he is represented by an eagle. But I also like to think that his Christology is as from the bosom of Christ, where we find him reclining at the Last Supper. Let me give you the briefest possible introduction to the structure of the Gospel of John now. And at this point, I must give all credit to, uh, for these observations to my doctoral advisor, Mikhail Waldstein. Uh, if memory serves, they, they come to him from one of his own mentors, uh, Ignace de la Pottery. The gospel can be divided into several parts. You've got the prologue, the book of signs, the book of glory, and an epilogue. The prologue is chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, and then the book of signs picks up from there with verse 19 and continues through John 12. Uh, the book of signs 
so to speak, is characterized by a series of six signs. The water turned uh, wine at Cana. And you have some healings. The healing of the royal official's son. The healing of the lame man at the pool, uh, by the pool of Siloam. The multiplication of the loaves in John 6. The healing of the man born blind. And then climactically, the raising of Lazarus. And of course, the apostles know that before they go to, uh, to uh, where Jesus is going to raise Lazarus, that mystically, he's going to be taking Lazarus' place, right? Yeah, a fascinating topic for a lecture itself. But anyway, woven throughout the book of signs are a series of trips between Galilee and Jerusalem to celebrate the various Jewish feasts. Uh, most crucially, the Passover or Pascha. The final trip to Jerusalem marks the transition into the Book of Glory. So after, of course, he raises Lazarus from the dead, then uh, they realize, well, we really need to put this man to death. And so it moves into the Passion narrative, right? Uh, so the... Uh, the final trip to Jerusalem marks transition into the book of glory, which leads the reader through a series of crucial theological discourses before the 11 at the Last Supper and builds up to the manifestation of a seventh sign uh, within the book of glory, which is the blood and water flowing from the pierced side of Christ. The climax of the book of glory, of course, is the manifestation of the glory of Christ through his resurrection and his appearances to the disciples. Regarding to the, the, um, the 11 apostles, uh, Judas is like the, the faithless fan who leaves the game uh, right before the ninth inning rally. Uh, we read in John 13, therefore that one, after he took the piece of bread, immediately went out and it was night. When therefore he went out, Jesus says, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify himself in him, and immediately he will glorify him. So Judas receives the fragment. Uh, he goes out. The devil enters into him. He goes out, and it was night. And then immediately, glory, 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 glory. Uh, five times Jesus uh, uses this word for uh, uh, his glorification. And so you really get the, the sense of the, um, the magnitude of the divine glory in this dark night. And that makes us think again of the uh, prologue, the light, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not uh, received it. You may notice my translation is a little bit different. I do, I do my own translation uh, uh, work here and there. You can find some of my translations on my academia. If you just search my name and then academia.edu, I've, I've published some of my translations like the Epistles to John and the Letter to the Hebrews. It's purely for academic work. It's not any official uh, church uh, <laughs> uh, translation or anything like that. But um, my own wrestling with the, uh, with the Greek text, which I will present here uh, to you. So, um, uh, so Judas does not stay through the night to hear the discourses about the glory of the Son's union with the Father and the promise of the coming Spirit, climaxing with the high priestly prayer of Jesus before the return of the betrayer. And so later in Acts, in, in the Acts of the Apostles, the 11 will quote the imprecatory psalm, Psalm 108, and they'll say, his office let another take. It's, it's a really strong um, uh, uh, psalm. That sounds like a, a, a very challenging psalm for people to, to pray. I think it's one of those that was even removed, uh, regrettably, I think, from the, um, uh, from the Psalter. Uh, but, uh, but, but anyhow, this was uh, uh, interpreted to mean to refer to Jesus, uh, Judas. So the Gospel concludes, the Gospel of John concludes with the story at the shore. Uh, where uh, Peter, of course, is, uh, is brought back to the charcoal fire and affirms his, his love for Jesus three times. 
Some scholars think that the gospel concluded at the end of, of John chapter 20 because it almost reads like that's the ending. And then uh, chapter 21 just seems like, well, and here's more, one more story. Uh, but what's subtle and lovely in that is that the epilogue continues that uh, Galilee-Jerusalem back and forth movement that you see all throughout the, uh, the gospel. Very consistent. So we end up back at Galilee where we started at the, in John 21. So anyway, now that we have the gospel structure, let's focus on the prologue, which is something of a microcosm of the whole gospel. Uh, I would like to start with my translation of the so-called last gospel, uh, John 1, 1 through 14, as I will be coming back to various parts of it throughout the lecture. In the beginning was the word, and here word is logos, logos. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. This one was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through him, and not one thing which has come to be came to be apart from him. In whom was life was the life and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not received it. There was a man sent by God whose name was John. This one came unto witness, so that he should bear witness about the light, so that all should believe through him. That one was not the light, but that he should bear witness about the light, the true light, which enlightens every man, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came to be through him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own things, and his own people did not accept him. But as many as received him, he gave to them authority to become children of God to those who believed in his name, who was born, not from bloods, nor from the will of the flesh, nor from the will of a man, but from God. And the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. And we have beheld his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, what you know as uh, the last gospel, uh, especially if, if you attend the Extraordinary Forum, um, my wife and I have been uh, going to the Extraordinary Forum for a little over a decade now, and um, uh, so you, you, uh, you hear this at the end of, of every Mass in the Extraordinary Forum. So what you might know if you go to the Extraordinary Forum is last gospel, biblical scholarship calls the prologue. Who is this word or logos in the Gospel of John? First, let's see who he is not. He is not a mere creature or a mere man. He's not a demigod either, sort of a quasi-god created by God in order to keep his distance from the world. He is eternal, and he is also creator of the existing world. It's worth, worth noting that John is not the first to observe an almighty word of God. In the Psalms, for example, we read, quote, By the word, logos, of, of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all their hosts by the breath of his mouth. We read the following about the dark night of Passover in the Book of Wisdom. For while all things were encompassed by hushed silence, and night in its proper haste was half spent, your almighty word from the heavens, a relentless warrior, leapt out of the royal thrones into the midst of a doomed world, bearing the sharp sword of your sincere command. And taking his stand, he filled all things with death, and he touched heaven while stepping upon the earth. When the psalmist 
tells of the grumbling in the wilderness, he speaks of a word sent from God to heal. When they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress, he sent forth his word, Logos, and healed them and delivered them from destruction. So it is not as though in the Gospel of John we have some sort of Hellenization or or imposition of Greek thought onto uh, uh, the, uh, the person of Christ. Instead, there is already a biblical context for understanding the all-powerful word that proceeds from God, that God sends out. So for John, the Logos is almighty, he's creator, he's glorious, he's the source of all life. Adrian Fortescue tells us that sometime during the 12th century, the last gospel began to be read as part of the priest's devotions after Mass. Fortescue uh, tells us that Pope St. Pius V, uh, quote, made this practice universal for the Roman rite in his edition of the Missal in 1570, end quote. For centuries, at every Mass, all would hear the words, et verbum caro factum est, declaring the ineffable sublimity of this mystery of our faith, that the eternal Son of God became human for our sake. Here we, of course, genuflect, and it is not lost on us that the mystery of the words becoming flesh is the very mystery that we participate in via the reception of the Holy Eucharist. So it appears quite deliberate that this mystery is re-echoed to those who have been satiated by the heavenly food. So I I hope to strike something of a natural progression between my two papers uh, 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 at this conference from the words condescension in the flesh in the Gospel of John is coming into the world at Christmas to that flesh's entrance into the heavenly temple as the perfect sacrifice for our salvation in the epistle to the Hebrews, which is connected with the mystery of the resurrection and ascension into heaven. Let's begin with a little etymology uh, on on, uh, the word incarnation. And as the first speaker, I I hope I'm not uh, uh, depriving someone else of the, the etymological root. But anyway, what is the meaning of the incarnation? It comes to us from the word in which means in, (laughs) and carnis, which means flesh or meat. The favorite dinosaur of most little boys is invariably some sort of carnivore uh, or meat eater. In Greek, the the Greek version of carnis is sarx. You are likely familiar with the word sarcophagus, uh, which means flesh eating. It's a rather morbid name for a coffin, if you think about it. But um, um, it is basically etymologically much like uh, carnivore. Sarcophagus means flesh eating. Sarx is a very important word in the Greek New Testament and in Greek patristic thought. We use a verb form of this word in the Nicene Creed, uh, uh, which, of course, we don't pray in Greek, but if you did, you would notice it. Uh, sarkao. Uh, and in Greek, there's also a noun to describe the process of becoming flesh, sarcosis. Our food, go, our, our lunch that we ate today is right now going through a kind of a sarcosis, right? It's the, the lower is taken up into the higher, it becomes our, our meat um, during digestion. In the incarnation, the process is reversed. The higher stoops down and enters into the lower, The wonder of Christ's humility should not be lost on us. As St. Paul says in Philippians, he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant. The depth of the mystery of the condescension reminds me of a prayer in the Jewish Haggadah called the Dayenu, in which they repeat uh, the marvelous deeds of the Lord accomplished in the Exodus. And at the end of of each of these, um, uh, these deeds, they say deinu, which means would have been sufficient. If he, uh, uh, quote, if he had taken us out of Egypt, but had not punished them, it would have been sufficient. 
If he had punished them but not destroyed their gods, it would have been sufficient. If he had destroyed their gods but had not killed their firstborn, it would have been sufficient. If he had killed their firstborn but not given us their money, it would have been sufficient. And so on. The one praying is in awe of the marvelous deeds of the Lord. The, uh, the extent to which he makes known his love to his people over and through the mystery of scourging Egypt. Well, we should be also, even if even had the Lord not given himself in the Eucharist, it would have been sufficient just simply to uh, become one of us. Thus, let us genuflect not only with our knees, but also with our hearts bowing before uh, this mystery. The eternal and omnipotent word of the Father has become meat, stuff, and not just any kind of stuff, but our stuff, our mud. The Logos became sarks. Uh, silently in the background of this prologue, we find the Virgin. On a purely tangential note, pun intended, it should be observed that there is a famous textual variant here in verse 13. Listen to the, different, uh, the difference in the readings. So I'll read verse 12, and then I'll read the different uh, variants in uh, verse 13. But as many as received him, he gave them authority to become children of God, to those who believed in his name, who were born, not from bloods, nor from the will of the flesh, nor from the will of God, uh, from the will of man, but from God. The, uh, the other version, who was born not from bloods, nor from the will of the flesh, nor from the will of a man, but from God. Now, the, the difference there is very subtle. But when we learn grammar, we learn that we need to ask what the antecedent of is to a particular pronoun. And so in, in verse 13, the uh, relative pronoun in the dominant manuscript tradition, and sometimes uh, various uh, codices don't agree, that they're, they're uh, um, uh, different notes in what's called the apparatus of the original text in the critical edition that shows that one text tradition has it one way, one has it another. But uh, the dominant manuscript tra tradition has the plural of the relative pronoun who. Uh, so they were born. But, and, and, so the antecedent then is, uh, to that pronoun is obviously children, the children who were born. But the variant reading in, this, uh, um, in, the, sing uh, in the singular, which Irenaeus, Origen, Ambrose, Augustine, Jerome, and others knew about, was in the singular, who was born. Uh, and so then who's the antecedent there? Well, it's Christ. Uh, Christ was, uh, was born not from bloods, nor from the will of the flesh, nor from the will of a man, but from God. Uh, some, such as Ignace de la Pottery, have seen a potential scriptural reference to the virgin birth here. De la Pottery points out that Irenaeus' reference, along with other second century Christian writers, is particularly significant because they predate the most ancient of the manuscripts that we possess in the textual tradition. So in other words, the oldest Bible manuscripts that we have, uh, we, we, we have older witnesses suggesting that the, uh, uh, that the singular is at least part of the manuscript tradition uh, as much as a century before. So, Regardless of what you think is correct about the, uh, uh, the, the reading there, uh, De La Pottery emph emphatically defends the singular reading that this verse re refers to Christ. If, if Christ is born not from bloods, that is, from the mixed bloods uh, that the ancients understood to be part of the process of conception and childbirth, what could this refer to other than the miraculous nature of his entry into the world. And it would be remarkably harmonious with what the apostle is doing theologically here. Regardless, the ambiguity in the text helps us to perceive 
a, the deeper mystery, that of the eternal, the eternal son, the eternal son's entrance into creation itself, into the world of matter. This is why the fathers of the church do not speak of the uh, do, do not speak of labor pains of the virgin mother. Instead, they assert that the birth of Christ was miraculous. Maximus the Confessor, for example, uh, who insists on the preservation of Christ's human nature unchanged in the Incarnation, repeats often that Christ innovated or renewed the law of conception and birth. In other words, just as the Virgin Mother conceived without pleasure, so she also bore her Savior without pain. The doctrine of Mary's perpetual virginity is that she is virgin before, during, after the birth of Christ. And this challenges us to think about, uh, to maybe reconsider what we think about uh, virginity. So for, for the uh, fathers uh, and for the ancients, virginity is a, uh, is a physical designation, not, not simply uh, regarding the status of whether one has known man. So the Lord, in being born from his virgin mother, preserves her uh, as he did uh, being raised from the intact tomb. So the, uh, and, and Pope Benedict talks about this in his infancy narratives. He writes, quote, If God does not also have power over matter, then he simply is not God. But he does have this power. And through the conception and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he has ushered in a new creation. So as the creator, he is also our redeemer. Hence the conception and the birth of Jesus from the Virgin Mary is a fundamental element of our faith and a radiant sign of hope, end quote. Regardless of whether the te text is singular or plural, the mystery of Mary's fiat is in the background, her yes. For those of you who wish it could be Christmas year-round, I encourage you to uh, find in the last gospel a little bit of Christmas, especially as the last gospel is the gospel that's, uh, that, that is read at the daytime mass on Christmas Day, both in the ordinary and the extraordinary forms. So the Christmas mystery is, is uh, it, you know, people say that the Gospel of John doesn't have an infancy narrative, but the Christmas mystery is, is uh, deeply uh, theologically woven into his prologue. Further, Christ becoming flesh is not uh, some, uh, sort of simply one wonder among many, but it is deeply dogmatic. His becoming Sarx is proclaimed in the Creed. In fact, Sarx, or at least its Eng English cor corollary, was one of those words that reappeared, so to speak, in the revision of the Roman Missal in 2013. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. The Greek background there is sarkothenta from sarkao. Recall that before the revision of the Novus Ordo, we used to say, uh, uh, by, the, by the power of the Holy Spirit, was born of the Virgin Mary, not was incarnate of the Virgin Mary. And, and notice here that as at the last gospel, we genuflect uh, in extraordinary form, we bow in the, the Novus Ordo. Incarnatus est de Spiritus Sancto. Ex Maria Virginae et homo factus est. Now let's look at some of the patristic exegesis of this critical uh, verse. In the patristic era, as Christological doctrine is being developed, much of the discussion centered around this logos sarx union. What did it mean exactly that the word had become flesh? There were two particularly important theologians of the 4th century that I want to introduce you to on this question, Athanasius of Alexandria and Gregory of Nazianzus. And to do that, we will have to briefly discuss the chief heretics they were responding to, namely Arius 
and Polinarius. Athanasius of Alexandria is the uh, most famous defender of Nicene Orthodoxy. Many of our secular peers might make the argument that Christianity thrived only because of Constantine. Maybe you've heard this from uh, popular atheists. After all, uh, um, the Council of Nicaea occurred only just over a decade after the, uh, Constantine's Battle of the Milvian Bridge and the Edict of Milan. It would be difficult to imagine a Council of Nicaea taking place were it not for Constantine's uh, legalization of Christianity. But Nicene Orthodoxy is, a hard, is hardly Constantine's gift to the church. Many have pointed out that Constantine was surrounded by semi-Arians in his imperial court. In the melancholic words of St. Jerome, quote, the whole world groaned and was astonished to find itself Arian. And he's writing this long after uh, uh, Nicaea. So a Athanasius himself, after Nicaea, he spent 17 of his 45 years as bishop in exile. Over his defense of the consubstantiality of the father and the son. And it was much thanks to Athanasius's travels, ironically, uh, that the gospel of uh, the Trinitarian doctrine spread throughout the Western Roman Empire. But Athanasius has a marvelous work. Um, it's not very long. I'd encourage you to read it called On the Incarnation. And uh, you, you, can, you can get it in the little popular patristic series. It's a, fa a fantastic introduction by C.S. Lewis. But in, in On the Incarnation, he talks about the divine dilemma, uh, and, and he looks at uh, creation and the fall, and, and he says, well, yes, God is, is omniscient. He's all-knowing. Uh, why would he have even made man in the first place had he known that they were going to fall? And if he had known that they were going to, to fall, why would he have given them a, com them a commandment that he would have known that they would have broken, right? So, uh, and if he were to just dissolve the punishment associated with the commandment, then that would make him a bad legislator. And so why legislate at all? So this is his, uh, d the, the dilemma that Athanasius sets up. And of course, Christ is the answer. Uh, he becomes incarnate and bears the, um, uh, the, the consequence of, of the curse and, uh, and redeems fallen Adam. So, uh, w but one of the, the disciples of Athanasius was fiercely opposed to the heretic Arius, and his name was Apollinarius. Apollinarius the Younger, that is. His father, Apollinarius the Elder, was one of the bishops at Nicaea. And both father and son, uh, both Apollinarii, I guess, uh, were, um, were def great defenders of the Nicene Doctrine. So far, so good. In Apollinarius, however, we see something of an interesting phenomenon that would come to repeat itself uh, often. When you base your theology in staunch opposition to someone else, and, and here he was opposing Arius, because Arius had taught that there was a time when the sun was not. Made a song out of it. There was a time when the sun was not. Uh, and so uh, Apollinarius uh, opposed him so staunchly that he ran into the opposite error. And uh, I, I don't think there's a stretch to say we see sort of this sort of thing in the church today. When we uh, fight uh, someone uh, too fiercely, we uh, may end up falling into the, uh, the opposite error. For Apollinarius, he wishes to preserve Christ from uh, something that, that Balthazar described as the scandal of the incarnation. The Apollinarian position is essentially this, that the Logos takes the place of the soul of Christ. And so in such a system, the flesh or the sarks would simply be an instrument of the divinity. 
I hope this doesn't sound good to any of you because it's not true. Um, Thus, the word becomes something of an animating principle of the humanity of Christ. And we should note that uh, Apollinarius thinks he's being faithful to Nicaea and to the thought of Athanasius. For Apollinarius, if Christ had a, a human soul, he would be Arian. He would be an Arian Christ. As uh, Grillmeyer uh, said, Arianism and Apollinarianism stand at two extreme ends in their interpretation of the meaning of the Logos Sarx union. So that brings us to Gregory Nazianzus. In the fourth century, Gregory Nazianzen formulates what we might call the, his Assumption Doctrine. Now, when most Catholics hear Assumption, they think of the ascent of the Virgin Mother of God into the Divine Presence, Body, and Soul. Uh, and on a tangential note, it's interesting that we have evidence of the Feast of the Dormition from the, fifth, the early 5th century. But when I say the Assumption Doctrine, I, here I mean uh, a very simple Christological saying, and that is, what is not assumed is not healed. What is not assumed is not healed. Here is what Gregory writes to the presbyter Clodonius in one of his epistles. Quote, whoever has set his hope on a human being without mind is actually mindless himself and unworthy of being saved in his entirety. Gregory was fantastic. Uh, The unassumed is the unhealed, but what is united with God is also being saved. Had half of Adam fallen, what was assumed in being saved would have been half too. But if the whole fell, he is united to the whole of what was born and is being saved wholly. They are not then to begrudge us our entire salvation or to fit out a savior with only bones and sinews and the picture of a human being, end quote. Gregory helps us to really understand what the nature of the flesh is that Christ assumed. It is not mindless flesh, because then our darkened intellects would have no hope of healing. It is not soulless flesh, because then our lost souls would be lost forever, and only the body could be healed. Later, this dictum, what is uh, unassumed is unhealed, would become crucial for helping to further develop and articulate Christological doctrine. In the 5th century, if Christ did not take on a fully human nature, then our natures are not healed. In the 6th and 7th centuries, if Christ did not take on a fully human will and activity, uh, then there would be no human activity or cooperation in redemption. There would be no healing of our wills, uh, which, as Maximus the Confessor would point out, is the very first thing to have fallen in paradise. In light of this, some patristic scholars, such as uh, Grillmeyer, have criticized Athanasius for what they detect as a word flesh Christology, arguing that his thought is essentially Apollinarian before Apollinarius. But as Father Brian Daly has pointed out, some contemporary Athanasius scholars, such as Caledon Antolios, have defended Athanasius that he is concerned above all to argue that the redeeming Logos, despite the shocking Christian confession that he has become flesh, and taken on himself all the human possibilities associated with that flesh, is not himself a creature, and is uh, not himself either passable or changeable. Instead, Anatolios recognizes what Athanasius is doing and classifies his his Christology as an in-order-that Christology. And all of this builds toward uh, what we see in the synthesis at the Council of Chalcedon in 451, which gives a very clear and thorough account of the unity of the two natures in the one hypostasis of the eternal son. Uh, Eutyches, uh, who is trying very hard to avoid the two-person Christ of Nestorius, had proposed the mixing of the divine and human natures in the incarnation of Christ. I hope that's, that doesn't sound good either. But Pope St. Leo the Great showed that Eutyches did not provide a suitable solution 
as Leo wrote in his tome to Flavian. This is where we get the phrase, the hypostatic union. Following the wisdom of Pope St. Leo the Great, the confession in Chalcedon declared the two natures, divinity and humanity, to be united in one hypostasis of the eternal son without confusion, change, division, or separation. One person, two natures, each nature preserving its own integrity, whole and entire. So these two natures without division, change, uh, confusion, or separation, uh, they don't mix. Now, two natures also means two activities and wills. And here, let us briefly return to the second part of verse 14. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The, and, and this is sort of the, the pinnacle of the Christological uh, defi- um, development in the, uh, in the 8th century with the first iconoclastic controversy. So what, what we find here in the Gospel of John is that the uncircumscribed, it sounds like a big word, but it means, uh, circumscribed just means written around, or it has a kind of a boundary. Uh, God is uncircumscribed. He's, he's limitless. He's not contained. But the uncircumscribed God has become, has become circumscribed for us. So he's become a limited. He has become uh, contained, as it were. The words becoming flesh means that we can now depict him uh, in art. Iconoclasm, therefore, is never a suitable response to the reverence for the divine in Christ. Uh, the, the emperor at the time, uh, uh, Leo had, had uh, wanted to impose a very literalistic reading of the Ten Commandments uh, of not making a graven image upon the church. Look at all the icons in the church. Obviously, the Christians are breaking the, uh, um, the, the, the first commandment. They're, they're blaspheming. And so uh, this led to the first great iconoclastic controversy, which was uh, then dealt with at Second Nicaea in 787, wh- which declared that Christ could indeed be depicted. Now, of course, the emperor didn't do away with minting his own coin. Uh, uh, but anyhow, I digress. <clears throat> but in the gospel, uh, Philip, the apostle, says, uh, show us the Father and we shall be satisfied. Jesus responds saying, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Christ is the perfect image, the perfect icon of the Father. And, and, and that comes through uh, very strongly, not only in the Gospel of John, but in uh, Colossians, Hebrews, and so on. So anyway, that's a very brief rundown of uh, patristic uh, uh, thought and far from complete. But as you can see, uh, this is the meaning the fathers in the golden age of the patristic era were able to derive from uh, verbum caro factum est. So clearly, these patristic considerations have serious consequences for Eucharistic doctrine. We believe that Jesus is really and truly present in the most holy Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity. The first three declaring his humanity, body, blood, soul. The last declaring his divinity. Returning to the linguistic question, where do we find this word sarx in the New Testament? It occurs most often in Paul's letter to the Romans, at times in a uh, negative context, like the, uh, the, the passions of the flesh, for example. And only occasionally does it occur in the synoptics. Predom- predominant usage in the gospel is in the gospel of John, where sarx occurs 13 times. And seven of those 13 occur in John 6, which you know what John 6 is all about. It's the bread of life, 
uh, discourse. And it, and all six of those, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, um, uh, I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, so seven of those 13 occur at John 6 at the climax of the Bread of Life discourse. And this is before many of his disciples depart. Uh, so let's look uh, closely, zero in on uh, John 6, verses 51 to 58. Again, this is my translation, so if you don't like it, I'm not offended. Um, but uh, it's, it's uh, uh, a very uh, close reading of the, uh, the text itself. He says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can, this man, uh, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. Now our separated brethren do not understand that this word who became flesh has given his flesh as bread. He even asks us to chew on him. As the Greek word uh, trogo, he repeats often, uh, suggests. It means to gnaw or chew with the teeth. He even let his disciples leave when they understood the full import of what he means. If our separated brethren were correct, and this, this, is, and this is only metaphorical, Jesus lets them leave under a supposedly false pretense, and that would make him a liar. He would have an obligation to correct their misunderstanding, but his flesh and blood are true food and drink. This bread become flesh is not a mere metaphor. We know what he means. The bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. We have the life of the world in us when we hear the mystery of the incarnation proclaimed in the last gospel. Christ is truly in us. As the living Father sent me and as I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will live because of me. As we wrap up, uh, let us briefly look at the prologue to 1 John, written by our same apostle. What does the apostle tell us there? He writes, What from the beginning we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have beheld and our hands have touched concerning the logos of life, and the life was manifest, and we heard and testify and announced to you eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifest to us. What we have seen and heard, we announce also to you, so that you may have communion with us. And our communion is also with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we ourselves are writing the, these things to you, so that your joy may be full. Here we notice a mirthful joy in the words of John who proclaims that he has beheld the word of life and that his hands have touched. For John, bearing witness not only means testifying to the Lamb, as he does in relating the words of John the Baptist in John 1, and then again in Revelation with the Lamb standing as though slain, but it also means claiming, I have, I have seen him, I have touched him. 
It reminds us of Thomas's confession in John 20. After he bore his hand into the wounds of Christ, when he was urged not to be faithless, but to believe. Certainly, this also refers to uh, touching Christ while he was in the body, but there's definitely a Eucharistic aspect to this handling Christ. Devoting himself to uh, John, John as an apostle was devoting himself to the breaking of the bread and the fellowship. In other words, the Eucharist, the, the Eucharistic communion uh, and the uh, table fellowship. May our joy also be made full as he makes us full with his, with, uh, with his very self. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Clark. Uh, definitely not a faithless fan, but a good leadoff hitter for us. Reminded me of Ricky Henderson uh, back in the days of those who like baseball. He would oftentimes lead off with a home run or a double. And so we appreciate your, your leadoff skills setting the stage. And you really did set the stage for the whole week because you really brought together biblical exegesis, original translations, which are beautiful. Please keep doing that for the benefit of the church. Uh, the Fathers, Old and New Testament, Catechesis, Liturgy, Creed, uh, Christian History, Christology, History of the Councils, the exegesis of the fathers, ancient scholarship, and modern scholarship. And we're very grateful for all that hard work. Now, we want you also to thank on our behalf your wife, who's home with the four children, aging 20 months to 13 years. Um, and we thank her for allowing you to be here because we've been definitely blessed by your presentation. In the presentation, I ha had a few points. There was a, quite a few. I can't list them all, but there was so many to start with. I was really captured by this idea of, of, in John's gospel, the way he uses the word word or logos doesn't have to come from the Greek world, but in fact can be found in the Hebrew tradition, in the Old Testament itself, and in the Psalms. The word of God is sent to heal. I know that that re re resonated very deeply, as you later then talked about how what is assumed is being saved and healed. And I just think of how much healing we've all received when we receive Holy Communion. I mean, there's so much grace happening when we receive Holy Communion, the Word becoming flesh within us, that we are being saved and healed in the Holy Eucharist. And I really felt like you brought that home well. And I just long to receive Holy Communion now because of your talk. So thank you very much for that. You also went on to talk about uh, the miraculous birth of Christ, and I love this aspect of the fathers and how the fathers agreed that Christ's birth is miraculous. And I was just thinking of, wow, you know, Christ's birth is miraculous, and so is the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist and miraculous. God is so awesome. And uh, you highlighted uh, Gregory Nancy Ensign's assumption of uh, the assumption doctrine, right? Going back to that theme I just mentioned of God uh, redeeming and saving what he takes on. And so so God took on our human nature. He took on us so that we can be redeemed. Uh, such an insight into how much God loves us and how much God is present in our lives. Um, I live because of the Father. I love that translation. You know, I live because of the Father. And those who uh, eat uh, this bread lives because of me. Uh, beautiful, beautiful translation. So thank you very much, Dr. Clark. We really are grateful. 